Amen. As uh, you probably, I think I told, told you uh, uh, last week, we were starting a new series that will culminate at you know, on Easter Day. I, I did my scheduling, uh, um, I think yesterday I actually sit, sat down and did all my, my sermon scheduling until Easter and will culminate on Easter with um, a name which I believe will be fit, fit for that day, which is Jehovah Jireh. A name that was revealed to Israel when they needed a lamb to be given for them. So uh, we'll be uh, studying about six or seven, I probably should know, but I don't. <laughs> Count the Sundays until then, you'll find exactly how many names of God we'll be studying. But this, are, this is the first Sunday that we, we start this. And why do we do this? Well, there is this verse in the scriptures that uh, caught my attention a long time ago that says this, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. So this is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God. So knowing him and knowing him by his names that he chose to reveal to us in the scriptures is one of the greatest privileges we have as Christians. A name reveals one's identity, in the scriptures at least. I mean, if you hear the name Adrian or Adi, you probably don't know much about me. But the names that God reveals in the scriptures about himself they speak so much about who God is and what he is like. The word God exactly is found throughout the Bible, but the Lord reveals himself more personally through the various names which, with, with which he introduced himself in the scriptures to different people when they needed him most. These names will help us understand how to address God in prayer, how to approach God in prayer. How to claim his promises that are based on his essence, on his substance, on his, on his name. And we know that this will give us power as we pray and courage, boldness, I think it says in, in, uh, in Hebrews uh, 4, 16, that we can come with boldness to his throne of grace. Why? Because we get to know him. We know him by his revealed name or actually names. One of the classical uh, commentaries that probably many of you have or some we probably have in the country is in the house is Matthew Henry's, which most people don't use anymore because he's, you know, ancient. <laughs> but I like, I like Matthew Henry. And he, he writes these things. Actually, I think I put them on the screen. The better we know God, no, the better God is known, the more he is trusted. All the English, so I had to actually work through his English to understand what, his, what he meant. But I love this. The better God is known, the more he is trusted. So this is my prayer for these studies, that as we go to names we have heard a lot, because I'm not going to bring any new names, any fancy, I never, never heard names. No, we're going to, through, go, we're going to go through the basics or the, ba the, the things we've probably heard before. But as we hear this, I pray that we get, we get to know God more because we want, we need to trust him more. Those who know him to be a God of infinite wisdom, says Matt Henry, will trust him further than they can see him. Sometimes we trust just what we see. That's a human nature. But as we get to know God, we trust him, even only in the things that we do not see. And that is the essence of faith. We know him and we have faith in him. Those who know him to be a God of almighty power will trust him when creature confidence fail. When the things in this world that we put trust in fail, we know that he will never fail us. Second Chronicles 20, 12 says, Oh God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that's coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. In, that, in this verse in the scriptures, the enemies of Israel were mighty and strong and coming against them. And I said, the, the Jews said, Lord, will you punish them? Will you defeat them for us? We, we have nothing. We know nothing, we have no power, but one thing we have, our eyes are upon you. And I pray this will be our attitude, that we want to set our eyes upon God and expect him to work, even when things around us fail. And those who know him to be a God of infinite grace and goodness will trust him, though he slays them. I pray that no one here will get slayed, you know, or whatever the, the, the past tense, slain, whatever. Uh, but sometimes life feels just like that. 
it's not that God gives us punishment. Anna, was, Anna reads my notes. I ask Anna to read my notes and to just give me a, a first type perspective, you know. And she says, God doesn't do that. Eh, that's our perception sometimes. When things, bad things happen, we kind of blame God for, for those bad things. And sometimes God allows tests in our lives, trials, which he calls tests to grow us in faith. But as we trust him, we trust his grace and infinite wisdom and goodness, even though, like Job says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Job 13, for those who take notes, Job 13, Job 13 15. Those who know him to be a God of truth and faithfulness will rejoice in his word of promise and rest upon that, even if their eyes do not see yet the fulfillment. That is the essence of faith. If you take notes, jot down Hebrews 11.1. 1. Our faith is based not on what we see, but what, 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 on what we hope. And hope is not a wishful thinking. Hope is faith put in the future. I know my God will do this. The second thing there, the more we trust God, the more we seek God. The more we trust him, the more we know well, there's nothing we can do without him. The more we trust God, the more we can understand the essence of John 15, the first five verses, unless we abide in him, we can do nothing. We need to abide in him. We need to seek him more for everything we have or need is in him. God never did or nor never will disown or desert any that seek him and trust him. That's a promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the call is to know him, to trust him, and to know also that he will never leave us or forsake us. Though he may afflict us, he will not leave us comfortless. Though he seem to forsake them for a while, that's our human perspective. We feel that God has forgotten us. Psalms 22, we did this a few months, a month ago. Oh Lord, oh God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? That was Christ's cry. But he knew that God does not forsake us. They that know you will trust in you. Or as Matthew Henry says, they that know thee will trust in thee. I kind of changed that language. And I love how Paul writes these words. Are they on the screen? No, they're not. I know what I believed. Anyone corrects me? Come on. I know in whom I believed. Paul, Paul knew a lot and Paul believed a lot of things. But when he thinks of God, he doesn't say, I know what I believe about him. He says, I know in whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard until that day what was being trusted to me. That's 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, if you take notes. I know in whom I believed, knowing him, trusting him, just following him in obedience. So let us jump into the first name of God that we, we want to uh, present and to learn something from. And it's, uh, it's probably just fit to start with it because the Bible starts with these words. In the beginning, God, which it says Elohim, sorry, I have to read here, <laughs> created the heavens and the earth. So what does Elohim mean? Of course, a Jewish word, uh, a Hebrew word that may, has this name, this, this, uh, these meanings. The all-powerful one the creator, the governing power, the one who is mighty, strong, and prominent. And then it comes over 2,500 times in the Bible, 2,570 if you're picky. And 35 times, this one name, Elohim, in one chapter comes 32 times. And between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-4 comes 35 times. So it is important. One thing that Pastor Lou taught me years ago when we studied the uh, Bible together was this, if something is repeated in the, in, the, in the scriptures, pay attention. It means something. So Elohim, it is the name that uh, it's reflected in a way in what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrew 11. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Or the prophet Jeremiah, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heaven. This word, you know, just for those who are really into languages, has actually a plural form. 
But the, fan, the, the thing is that it, has, it never comes with a verb or an attribute that is in plural form, always singular. So this name for some see to ref, reflect the Godhead, the plura, plurality of God, the triune God. And it is a, probably the most appropriate name, the God, all-powerful one, the creator, that God revealed uh, himself through by bringing the world out of chaos, light out of darkness, a place to live in, to habitate out of desolation and life in his image. If we were to use one word to replace this Elohim, would be probably, all, actually that's two, two words. I, I, I thought of omnipotent, but I think it's a fancy word. So all powerful, all powerful, a great name, Elohim, the God creator, the governing power, the one who is mighty strong. But it's not the only name we're looking at. The second one is El Shaddai. We'll see why we get, we get these two names together. We'll make sense of it, hopefully, <laughs> by the end of this message. The second name we come from the scriptures is, is this, I am El Shaddai, which actually translates God Almighty. And this, name's, this name is revealed to Abraham for the first time in Genesis 17, 1, when God says these words, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. We heard this name El Shaddai. I think there are songs, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, you know, uh, songs I really uh, think went too far with uh, making up names. for. Anyway, that's a different pet thingy. So El Shaddai, very known name. And it means this, God Almighty, but has a specific, how say, um, collar to it. It says that it's the all-sufficient one. It says God Almighty, the all-sufficient one, the source of blessings, fullness, and fruitfulness. The name is compo com composite. It's got L, which brings the idea of God, uh, omnipotent, all-powerful God, but also Shaddai which we translate and the Jews translate as almighty, but it's, it's interesting that the Shaddai is the root verse or root word, sorry, of, of breast. And the meaning is the all powerful one who nourishes, supplies and satisfies. Or if you want, the one who pours out sustenance and blessing. It's more than just the almighty. It's the almighty who provides all the blessings and sustenance that you need. And it was given to Abraham in Genesis 17, 1, because that's exactly what he needed to know at that time. Let's actually go to that, uh, that passage. Oh, I should have clicked on that one. So you heard me saying it, so move on. Elohim El Shaddai has the power and authority to make and keep covenants. So El Shaddai has the power and authority to make and keep covenants. When Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, the Lord, appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face and Elohim said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations of, 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 for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and to your offsprings after you. And I will give you, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings. That's a fancy word, sojournings. It means traveler, travelings, I think, you know. All the land of Canaan for an, for, an, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God, their Elohim. For those who may not remember clearly the story of Abraham, let me bring you this story to, to light a bit. So there's a story of the promise. If you think Abraham, if one word comes to mind, may this word be promise, or if you want a fancy word, covenant. Because God starts his ministry or his work through Abraham in Genesis 12 when he makes him 
a promise or makes a covenant with him. When it says these words, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make you your name great. And so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and with and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And all your, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For those who are prone to study theology, this is an unconditional covenant. It has no strings attached. I will do this. No matter what you do, Abraham, I will do this. That's my part. And you just count or look at those I wills. Who does stuff here? I will show you. I will make you. I will bless you. I will bless those. I will curse those. And just at the end, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. By whom? Of course, by God. Unconditional covenant, a promise to Abraham to make him three things. To, give him, I mean, to make him a great nation, give him a land, and bless him, and make him a blessing. Land, people, blessing. That was the story. Sorry, that was the promise. But this problem, this, this story of the promise comes with a problem, the problem of the promise. And if you all know from me, because I've said this before here in this church, Genesis 11.30 gives us the first glimpse of Sarah, Sarai, as was initially her name, and her big issue. It says in Genesis 11.30, and Sarai was barren, which means she couldn't have kids. And to them, Abraham and Sarah, God gives this promise, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Here it is, exceedingly fruitful, you know. And if you know from Genesis 12, 4, Abram was already 75 years old. So he was 75 and she was 65 because there was 10 year difference between the Abraham and, and Sarah. So he was 75, she was 65 and God says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. You have no kids so far, I mean, you're not in your prime anymore. You know, I, I taught uh, somebody a, a new phrase. You're not spring chicken. Uh, you know, and somebody from Costa Rica didn't really get that phrase, but I think it's an American phrase. Anyway, but I will make this promise to you. But this is the problem. He's old. She's barren. But God said, yeah, you'll be exceedingly fruitful. And there is where the struggle starts. And I'm not going to go through all the, all the things of Genesis 12 to Genesis 20. 22, lots of chapters to look at that, at this promise and the problem and the struggle with the promise. Just give you some hints. Genesis 12, 10 and on Pharaoh in Egypt, where he arrives, where Abraham and Sarah arrive, likes Sarah. I mean, she was 65 and she was still attractive. Imagine that, you know? And I mean, that was awesome. She must have been an awesome woman. But at 65, she was the temptation for Pharaoh. But God protects her and not her. She was not, okay, God did protect her, don't get me wrong, but God was protecting the promise he made. And then, of course, Genesis 13, when Abraham brings Lot with him, which he shouldn't have, which he shouldn't have brought with him anyway, and Lot wants the land. The land that was promised to him, Abraham says, ah, you take it. And God stops and Abraham, all this land that you see, even if he chose it, all this land that you see is going to be yours. Why? Because I made you promise. A land, a people, and a blessing. And Genesis 15, um, Abraham looks at himself. He was up, there were probably 75 plus 8, 7, 8 uh, years. I'd say probably, what, my math is uh, 82, 83 years old. He looks at himself, God, you promised that, but I think I need to help you because you don't, I don't think you think you thought this through. That was Abraham's you know, discussion with God. Lord, I don't think you thought this through because I'm 82, she's 72. We got no kids. I mean, we know we, yeah, we, we tried. I mean, okay, that's my guess. I, I'm assuming they tried. So he says, let me bring El Eliezer, my servant. Let have, let, let's, let's make sure that maybe, you know, he can give, give us a son. And God reaffirms the covenant in Genesis 15, 5. No, it is you. It is you and Sarah. I'll make you as the stars in the heavens, as the sand in the, in the, on the shores of the sea. I love the Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed God, and God counted that as righteousness. Beautiful verse. And of course, then Genesis 16, again, um, they thought, I mean, I'm 80-something, she's 70-something. 
but my servant, she's young and beautiful. Let's try with, with her. I mean, Eliezer didn't work out. Let's try Hagar. Hagar, Hagar, how do you say in English? Hagar, I think it's in English. We say Agar in Iranian. Um, and they try, and actually something comes up, and Ishmael comes up, and, you know, the story, I mean, actually we'll come to the story um, in two weeks, uh, the story of Hagar and her son, because another name of God is revealed there. I'm the God who sees you, El Roy. That's a different story for a different day. But, you know, Abraham and Sarah continue to think that they have a better solution than God has. And they have to learn lesson upon lesson upon, and God has patience. When Lot was given, when Abraham gives Lot his own land, God says, no, you know what? You may have given that to Lot, but believe me, it's yours. When Abraham says, no, Eliezer must be the father of my son, God says, no, it's going to be you. When Abraham says, no, it's going to be Agar, the mother of my son. No, it's going to be Sarah. I promise that. You know, so all this, the story of promise has the problems and the struggles all weaved within in a pattern of growth. Abraham grows. He grows to, to know God because he knows God. He trusts God. He knows God and he trusts God. There are many other, not many, but a few other struggles here we're not going to go through. But as just go home and read Genesis 12 to Genesis 22 and think promise, problems, and struggles. And just look at the growth of Abraham's faith as he knows God more, as God reveals himself from Elohim to El Shaddai. And we'll see soon Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, the Lord who provides. I mean, El Roy was for Hagar only, so that's a separate story. But Abraham gets to know God more. As he knows God's, God more, he trusts God more. He knows that God is the God of the promise. This is your God. This is my God. The Lord of the promise. The El Shaddai is not just God Almighty, but God, who, God Almighty who can provide all that you need, the blessing and the sustenance. And he has got the authority and the power to make and keep covenants. El Shaddai has the power and authority to make and keep covenants. And it says this to Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, it's the third time I read this, so I think you'll know it by the end of the sermon. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. So God revealed his name again. No, sorry. God reveals a new name to Abraham. He knew him by, El, by, sorry, by Elohim so far. Right now, God says, I'm more. This is not a facet of who I am. You know me as El, Elohim, but actually, Think of me right now as El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Abram, Abram fell on his face and Elohim said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. El Shaddai restates the covenant before Abram. And God is revealed as El Shaddai in the face of the seemingly impossible promise that was made earlier to Abraham in Genesis 12, then 13, then 16, 15, and then 16 again. Read this word. I will hear these words. The God of the promise, our God, that I want you, I want myself to know, I want you to guys know is the God of the promise. It says this, listen. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Abraham was fighting doubts, was trying to bring solutions of his own. Tried to be faithful, but couldn't really see the, the end of this and was beginning to struggle with doubts and fears. And God says, fear not, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of my house, Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your solution ain't my solution. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look, be, look towards heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said to, to him, So shall your offspring be. That is the God of the promise. El Shaddai changes the name from Abram to Abraham. 
It says there, you were before called the father of a multitude. No. Your name shall no longer be called. Is this on the screen? It's on the screen, right? Yeah. Your name shall not be called Abram, which I put this as a note over there. It means the father of, of it means patriarch or exalted father, which was fitted for Abram as, you know, the father of, uh, I'm not father, the husband of Sarah right now. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and you will be, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. So it changed from Abraham to Abraham, patriarch to the father of a multitude of nations. Calling him Abraham, calling, calling this guy Abraham, you know, pay, not from patriarch, but from father of a multitude of nations, it's like calling me Curly. You know? But God is strong. And he's got this strong and clear way to affirm his promise. You know, look at these words. There are things that are in green over there. Not green, but whatever the color is. Yellow, orange. I'm a guy. I have made you. Hear these words. Abraham is 80-some year old. His wife is 70-some year old, barren. Have, they're childless. And God says, I have made you. The moment I promised you, my promise was true and real, even if your eyes could not see it. I have made you the father. It's not that you will become father. No, I have made you. It's a done deal. In God's eyes, even if it still looks impossible to us or to him in that case, the promise is already fulfilled. That is the God of promise. That's El Shaddai. How do we bring this home? And fear not, I have like a bunch more pages to, to go through. Not a bunch, two more. A book I read right now, it's by a guy named Nathan J. Stone, and it says this, there is a blessing, there is blessing and comfort in this great name of God. He means El Shaddai. Signifies supreme power, sovereignty, and glory, but also the powerful and faithful covenant giver and covenant keeper. You know what? Our world is full of chaos. And the more we go through history and news and whatever look around us, there seems to be more and more chaos. But in this world of chaos, Elohim never changes. El Shaddai always stays the same. Is there a connection between us and Abraham? Am I the only one here who f struggles with doubts sometimes? I don't think so. Am I the only one who knows God's promises, or some of them at least, but doesn't really see them fulfilled? in my life yet and therefore we struggle with emotional ro roller coasters with fear with doubts questions about future Abraham had them I bet you we have them too and in those moments we need to remember ourselves these words be still and know that I am God Elohim I will be exalted among the nations I'll be exalted in the earth and the verse continues, actually, I never really read this in together, but it says, the Lord of hosts, or Yehovah Shabbaoth, is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I need to do that. When I'm tempted to find my own solution, when God says, I will do this, and I'm like, ah, but Lord, it doesn't seem to be working. You know, did you actually think this through? Let me try this. And you'll thank me afterwards. That's my thought. You know, you guys know I'm a new Canadian. And back in 2018, I was struggling emotionally and mentally with how do I get my PR, permanent residency. I was, if you, for you guys, to, for you all that know the process, I was, I was, uh, I had 420 points. So I was enough to qualify. 400 was the qualifying number. I was above it, 420. But they called people to, to be invited at 450. I was short 30 points. And guess what? If you learn French, besides English, you get 30 points. So I bought myself, it's in the off, uh, it's at home actually. French, learn, you know, French for, uh, what's the word? French for, no, sorry, what's the, French for? It's not for idiots, it's French for dumb, dummies. Yeah, it was, okay, I knew there was something along those lines. I bought myself French for dummies and uh, I, oh, I'm gonna teach myself French. Guess what? Mandarin was actually easier. And it's not because French is actually hard, but my brain just could not absorb it. And I tried, man, I tried, because I thought 30 points, that will get me there. 
And he didn't. And guess what? I was short 30 points. And in October 2018, guess how many points God gave me? 600. I had my solution, which obviously did not work. I had a plan all along. And I failed to trust him fully because I thought my eyes don't see solutions. So I'm ha I have to make a new one, my own solution. It doesn't work. Guys, we serve a God who's the God of promise, El Shaddai, who's the almighty Elohim. His power is all his. He made the world out of chaos into this. And we doubt that he cannot do what he promised to us. Let's be honest, we do struggle with doubts. That's part of our life, unfortunately. Let's remember ourselves. Let's preach to ourselves these words. My God, my God, you are and always be El Shaddai, the Almighty who can sustain and provide and bless me. You have the power to do what you say. You are trustworthy and faithful. First Kings 8.23 says this. O oh Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on the earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. That's our God. How about us? What do we have in common with Abraham and his story? Again, I say, our human tendency to doubt and to fear, to try to help God with our human solutions. But also we share the same journey of faith. As we know God more, we trust God more. As we trust God more, we obey God more. That's not, that's make sense. I, I'm not trying to say, try harder. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, embark on this journey of knowing God. And the more you know him, the more you'll seek him. And the more you seek him, the more you trust him. The more you trust him, the easier it will become to obey him, even when you do not understand. Have this... Uh, some people laugh at it, but yeah, it's, it's my thing. You know, I made a law, the law of the ostrich. It says in Leviticus somewhere, I don't know exactly, I probably should know, but I don't know, that you shall not eat ostrich. I say, why? It's just a big bird. I mean, not the big bird, but a big bird. So why not eat? You know, if we eat turkey, why not ostrich? And I realized I was trying to scientifically explain why should I obey? I realized I wanted to obey just what I can explain or understand. But faith is different. Abraham learned that God must be obeyed even when you don't make sense. So for me, the law of the ostrich is this. God is calling me to do something. And even if I don't get it or I cannot explain, I will obey him because I trust him, because I know him. I know him. I trust him. I obey him. He's worthy of our trust. So a question for myself and for you guys is, what are our today's doubts? What is your today's fear? What is the anxiety you face today? And ask this question yourself, ask yourself this question, is that too much for El Shaddai? English has this thing that we use the word God so much, oh God, you know, or whatever, I'm not doing, doing it. We use God so much, it kind of loses its, its, its appeal. In Romania, there's uh, probably a uh, brother, uh, I mean, Dave might know this. I think here also, back in the day, when Christians walked into the church, would see, greet themselves, with, uh, greet each other with peace. Was that uh, the custom here? Peace, brother, peace, sister. Was that the uh, custom here in the past? Same in Romania. It still is. But I was not cut of the same mold as other, I mean, I'm unique. Like every other snowflake, I'm unique. Um, and I said, I don't want to use the word peace as a greeting. Because it's such a powerful and rich blessing. I want to say, Chuck, may God peace be with you. Peace, brother. I want to mean that. Not as a, yo, peace, brother. But as a, may God's richest peace be upon you. So I chose to say good morning and hello when I greeted people, not peace. Because I felt it demoted. demoted? It brought down the fullness of that word. Same with the word God. There's no way I can bring that word down, but I can add to it something like God Almighty El Shaddai, the Lord Creator who provides and sustains and is trustworthy. There's an unfinished story here, which I will finish, like I said, on Easter Day, more fully, more developed.
But I wanted you guys to remember of these words, that this this thoughts on his journey of faith. Abraham, Abraham grow no Abraham got to know God more and more, both as Elohim and then as El Shaddai, and he learned to trust God and obey Him even when His call or His command did not make sense. God eventually gave Sarah and Abraham a son named Isaac. When the son was, I think, was 13, 14 years old, God says to Abraham, go and kill your son. Actually, it's more, it says, go and bring him as a sacrifice to me, as an offering to me. And Abraham did not argue with God. He just did what God said. I have no idea what was in a father's heart when God says, do this. Because we're not talking about people who do this on a regular basis, like kill their kids and whatever. It was unusual and strange and against the very promise God made to Abraham, which God named Isaac as he is the one with whom, through whom your promise, this promise will be fulfilled. And now says God, God says, go kill him. It was a test of faith. And God did provide a better sacrifice, a lamb, which reminds to us of Christ the lamb. Abraham knew God. He chose to trust God, even though it did not make sense. And then God, the almighty Elohim, God El Shaddai, blessed Abraham. This is what we need to get to, to know him. Know him more. And this, this series is meant to help us to know God more. Because I want myself to trust God more. Not to question or doubt or fi- try to find my ways to, 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 you know, to supplement God's plan because I think it's not enough. But to actually know him and trust him and therefore live in obedience. The experience is sustenance and blessings. For he is always and will always be Elohim, the almighty creator. And El Shaddai, the almighty sustainer. This book I read uh, by Nathan J. Stone says this. Ah, actually, not on the screen, sorry. The name Almighty God, El Shaddai, speaks to us of the riches of our God, of the fullness of his grace in self-sacrificial love, pouring itself out for others. It tells us that God is the source of all good and perf- perfect gifts, that he never wearies of pouring out his mercy and, bless- and blessing on his people. But we must forget that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. That his sufficiency is most manifest in our insufficiency. That his fullness fullness in our emptiness. And that he fills us now so that rivers of living water can flow from us to a thirsty and needy humanity. If today you feel weak and or insufficient or empty, Elohim El Shaddai, the God Almighty, creator and sustainer, is unchanged and he is near. As a young agnostic seeker, I opened the Gospel of Mark many years ago, 1993, and I read these words. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And as a, as a guy who sought God and read these words, it hit me. God is at hand. It may be a phrase in English. It is a phrase in English. But for me as an ESL, it meant I can reach my hand and touch God and be, you know, God is at hand. God is like right here with me. It was so strong. I can never forget that day. The Bible I was using, the place I was at, and the words God spoke to me because God felt real in a way I have never experienced before. And the message was this, God is at hand. Of course, said then, repent and believe the gospel, which was steps I took later on to repent and believe the gospel. In the story about Abraham, the unfinished story that I spoke about, the land was provided to Abraham and Isaac as a hint, as a foreshadowing of the giving of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Jesus, the Messiah, was given a sacrifice because of our weakness, insufficiency, and emptiness. The same offer of the Lamb comes with the same call for me and for you. I say it again. Know him, trust him, and obey him. It's not meant to be try harder, try harder, try harder. No, it's just know him more. And the more you know him, 
the more you will love him and trust him. The more you trust him, obedience will come easier, even if you don't understand why. Come to him and surrender your inadequacies, fears, and doubts you may have today. And walk from this place with his peace. Let's pray.